Thank you for joining our Debbie Strain Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer webinar series on clinical updates in gastric cancer. Today's webinar is on the use and research of vaccines in the treatment of stomach cancer, and it is the second in a series of four webinars. I am Mary Margaret Kilmeyer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I'm the Programs Director for Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer and a licensed marriage and family therapist. My clinical and research background is focused on working collaboratively with doctors, patients, their families, and the members of a healthcare team. We would like to thank our gold sponsors, Lilly Oncology and Merck, as well as our bronze sponsors, Genentech and the 1000 Plus Club to Benefit Cancer for providing the funding to make this webinar possible. You will be able to ask questions throughout this presentation, which will be uh, responded to at the conclusion. You can type your questions into the section that appears on your webinar menu. We will address the questions at the conclusion of the presentation as time allows, and in addition, we will be recording this webinar to make it accessible on our website in the lecture library. First, I will share information about stomach cancer and Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. Then we will hear a presentation on vaccines and the treatment of stomach cancer by Dr. Daniel Catanacci of the University of Chicago. In 2018, it's estimated that more than 26,000 Americans will be diagnosed with stomach cancer, and more than 11,000 will die. Most patients are diagnosed at stage four when the five-year survival rate is only 5%, and the incidence rates in younger populations has been increasing. And yet, many know very little about this deadly disease, and little research is being done. Pictured here is the founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation. Debbie was diagnosed at stage four in, with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. She had no risk factors for stomach cancer and her symptoms were very vague. At the time, she was told that her chance of being alive in five years was only 4%. She endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and experienced many recurrences over nine and a half years. Unfortunately, Debbie passed away on December 23rd at the age of 50. She dedicated herself in helping others with stomach cancer by raising awareness and providing resources and education. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009, and as an organization, we are a member of several advocacy coalitions, including the Deadliest Cancer Coalition, the Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, and One Voice Against Cancer. Debbie served for many years as a patient advocate on numerous committees and task forces, and Debbie's Dream Foundation is proud to continue to sponsor volunteers to these organizations. DDF will continue on the important work and legacy left by Debbie Zellman. The mission of Debbie's Dream Foundation is to raise awareness about stomach cancer, advance funding for research, and provide education and support internationally to patients, their families, and their caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more by visiting our website at www.debbiesdream.org. In the almost 10 short years, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 28 chapters across the United States, as well as chapters in Canada and in Germany. We have events that are ongoing around the country all year long. Our patient resource education program helps patients, their families, and caregivers around the world by matching them with survivors and caregivers using disease-specific criteria, including their stage, biomarkers, and their location. We host educational webinars, such as the one you're listening to today, as well as symposia year-round, and our website contains in-depth information about stomach cancer and can be translated into more than 60 languages. We have also provided $850,000 in research grants and advocate each year during our Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Day to add stomach cancer to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. We will be returning to Washington, D.C. next February to maintain funding for researchers. These efforts in the past have resulted in nearly $18 million being awarded to stomach cancer researchers over three fiscal years, so please consider joining us February 25th and 26th in Washington. More information can be found on our website under the heading, Take Action. And here you can see a current snapshot of our website's homepage with links to numerous resources. Some of you may notice that the website has been newly redesigned and is designed to improve efficiency for patients to access it who are at home and on their mobile phones and devices. 
And here you can see some of the many events that we have on the horizon that are coming up. November is the month that's dedicated to stomach cancer. And at Debbie's Dream Foundation, we celebrate it as Curing Stomach Cancer Month. So you'll see throughout the year, or throughout the month of November, all around the country, there are events that are taking place, such as the North Carolina Golf Tournament on November 3rd, the fourth annual Dream Big Legacy Luncheon on November 7th, the New York Night of Laughter, it's the fourth annual of that event on November 11th, the South Florida Night of Laughter on November 15th. And then we'll be hosting our third and final symposium for the year of 2018 in Seattle on December 1st. 2018, so forgive the typo in the date, that's December 1st, 2018 coming up. DDF is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on this slide are important phone numbers and email addresses that you can use to contact our office and staff. We will be turning over the presentation in just a moment, and the presentation on vaccines and the treatment of stomach cancer is being presented by Dr. Daniel Catanacci. Dr. Catanacci is a medical oncologist at the University of Chicago, specializing in the treatment of GI malignancies with a focus on gastroesophageal cancers. Dr. Catanacci serves on the DDF's Scientific and Medical Advisory Board, and he was the recent recipient of the DDF Tree of Life Medical Award in recognition of his dedication and work with stomach cancer patients. We thank him for joining us today, and now, Dr. Catanacci, I'll turn the webinar over to you. Okay, thanks, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this very interesting topic, uh, clinical updates and vaccines and the treatment of gastric cancer. So this is how the talk is laid out. Uh, first, I'll just spend a few minutes just going over some of the background and building off um, some of the things that Mary Margaret just mentioned um, with respect to gastric and gastroesophageal cancer. Then we'll focus on immunotherapies and particularly vaccines and some of the promising things that are coming out of this and to look forward to in the future and then summarizing uh, what we discussed. So when we're talking about gastroesophageal cancer, there, there are essentially three main types of, of cancer that we're referring to. One is esophageal cancer that's called squamous cell or SCC. Another is called esophagastric junction adenocarcinoma, which is, takes right at the junction of where the esophagus meets the stomach. And then finally, there is gastric cancer or stomach cancer proper or the far end of the stomach. Sorry. Um, so when we're talking generally about gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma, we are referring to these latter two together when we're talking about treatments for the most part. So as you heard earlier, it's a, a very common cancer worldwide. And unfortunately, most patients progress at, at the stage of stage four disease, meaning it has spread outside of the area that it started. Um, even patients who have it found early enough in the earlier stages, stage one, two, or three, it still has a very high recurrence rate despite curative intent approaches, including surgery. So for the most part, we are talking about stage four cancer at some point in a patient's care. And so as you can see here, some of the things that we use to relay um, the prognosis or the severity of the problem is to talk about the median overall survival or median OS. And that is talking about the time point from the time of diagnosis to where 50% of patients are no longer alive with their cancer and 50% still are alive. So it is just a sort of a reference and there's a wide range around these time points, but it does sort of relay the severity of the issue. And this is how I discuss this with my patients. So without any therapy at all and looking back historically, best supportive care, median survival times ranged around three to six months. Now, of course, we have therapies, namely chemotherapy, and with chemotherapy treatments to patients, we can increase that median survival time to around 10 to 12 months. And again, that is a median. So there is a range about this, and we often have patients that exceed this three-year mark, et cetera. Um, so chemotherapy improves median overall survival compared to no therapy. And most importantly, it also improves symptoms from the cancer. It's called palliative chemotherapy for a reason. And so this um, improves or maintains quality of life, and this is the goal of therapy. 
Some of those symptoms could be pain, some could be swallowing problems, etc. And these often get better. And the reason for that is because chemotherapy can have what's called a response rate, or it can shrink the cancers, which we define as being 30% or more shrinkage from what we started at in terms of size. So about 40% of patients with standard chemotherapy, the first type of chemotherapy that we use, or so-called first-line chemotherapy, and about 40% of patients. So 40% of patients will have 30% shrinkage or more of their cancer. And another large subset of, of patients, 40 to 45 percent of patients, will have at least at least the disease stability control. It's not growing, um, and so the vast majority of patients, 80 to 85 percent of patients with chemotherapy, will have some uh, improvement in quality of life and stability of their cancer, which is why we use chemotherapy. So uh, an emerging sort of standard regimen to use for chemotherapy is called Folfox. And that is an acronym for two chemotherapy drugs, 5-FU and oxaliplatin. The problem is, even in the best case scenario where we do have a response rate, or, and sometimes almost complete response, where it's no longer visible on scans, and it's tolerable without many uh, major side effects, eventually the problem is we expect that some of the cancer cells will learn how to grow and become resistant to this therapy. So whenever that happens, whether it's four months later or a year later or two years later, we're prepared and we have other chemotherapy regimens uh, that we go to in so-called second line and later lines, third line, et cetera, that we keep switching to as necessary until we run out of good options to use and or we feel like um, the, the patient is no longer strong enough to continue with further therapy, something that we call performance status. So. That is sort of the standard of care to date, and we know that we can improve outcomes, but how else can we improve improve outcomes going forward? So the so-called targeted therapies, which we'll sort of allude to but not focus on in this talk, and then immunotherapies, which we'll also focus on in this talk. So the standard targeted uh, therapy for this particular cancer is anti-HER2 therapy called trastuzumab, for HER2 amplified uh, cancers. And as you can see here, HER2 amplification accounts for about 10 to 15% of this cancer type. It's a little bit more common in the, the proximal or the, the GE junction type of cancer at about 15 to even up to 20%, whereas the so-called distal gastric cancer or the stomach cancer proper, it's more around 10%. So regardless, if, you ha if a patient has HER2 amplification, we now know that chemotherapy plus trastuzumab is the standard of care and has improved survival in those patients, the median survival time to about 16 to 18 months. And as you heard earlier, Debbie um, actually had HER2 amplification, and uh, this is an exact example of how this is just a reference and that there is a wide range around it. And we saw that uh, Debbie survived her cancer almost 10 years. Um, it would be rare, but it is possible. So you can see that the vast majority, however, do not currently have a standard uh, targeted therapy in the first line setting, and we have chemotherapy to use in that situation. In the second line setting, we also have targeted therapies, um, and this is for all patients without any specific selection, and that is called antiangiogenesis with a drug called remucirumab. And so this is referring to two clinical studies published in these years that were uh, testing remucirumab either alone or in combination with standard chemotherapy. And you can see that the median survival times were higher um, um, on the order of a few months, and that led to approval, and, and, and now this is a standard of care for therapy, for second-line chemotherapy. Uh, we also know that sometimes patients who start with Fulfox chemotherapy, they can have a side effect called neur uh, neuropathy or neurotoxicity, and so switching to second-line therapy with a neurotoxic drug like paclitaxel sometimes is not the best option. And there are other drugs like irinotecan-based regimens or fulfiri that um, could uh, limit the neurotoxicity. And, and a report that we have coming out and is also being tested in another clinical study ongoing currently and combining this regimen with remucirumab as being sort of a substitute for other neurotoxic drugs. So something to be aware of. And then finally, the other standard therapy is pembrolizumab, an, an immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor. And this is uh, what the first approval 
that we saw in this cancer. And it was actually approval across all cancer types, solid tumor cancers that have a specific genetic finding called microsatellite instability high or MSI high. And this was sort of a very unprecedented approval by the FDA, but it was because the results were so striking in these patients that it led to an accelerated approval and now full approval. And so that's because on a survival curve I've shown here in this F panel is that as you start at time zero and time goes by, normally patients with stage four cancer, you will see uh, this line going down and almost going to zero. But in this situation, in these patients, you can see this remarkable plateau that was ongoing. And this is saying that a large subset of patients that were treated with immunotherapy pembrolizumab or Keytruda, that there was a subset, a large subset that had very long standing control, um, control and survival times, which was unprecedented. And this was even after stopping at two year, at the two year mark when this trial just stopped therapy to follow patients. And you can see that patients continued doing well afterwards, even off of therapy. Of course, uh, gastroesophageal cancer was a subset of the patients in this, in this study. And you can see of those patients that are listed here with the arrows, there was a, a remarkable response rate, 60%. And this is in later lines of therapy, second line or higher. And this response rate is even higher than first line chemotherapy. So very remarkable. Um, there are other studies called Keynote 59 and Keynote 61 that also had subsets of patients, seven and 15 patients with MSI high tumors, and they also had remarkable response rates. So this is now a standard of care for second line patients or higher that have MSI high tumors. The problem is, is that in the stage four setting is that this is a very rare finding. Um, in earlier stages, stages one to three, it could be a little bit more common, but that's not where this is approved for or indicated at the moment. So what else do we have for the majority of patients? Well, it, with immunotherapy. So the Keynote 59 study was a, a large study of a number of patients that um, that were selecting for PDL1 positive patients, um, which accounts for about 50 to 60% of the total. And it was in the third line setting or higher. And you can see here that the response rates in the PDL1 positive subset was nearly 16%, whereas if they were PDL1 negative, it was six, uh, six to 7%. However, if you exclude patients that were enrolled in this study that I showed on the prior slide that had MSI high features of the tumor, and you just looked at patients that were not MSI high or what we call microsatellite stable MSS and PDL1 positive, about 13.7% of those patients that were given pembrolizumab had a response. So that accounts for about two to three patients out of 20 that we would expect to derive substantial benefit from pembrolizumab. This led to approval um, um, more than a year ago now and is published here. So this is a standard of care for PDL1 positive patient cancers in the third line setting or higher. The, re the response rate is lower than MSI high tumors, but it is uh, for something to note is that of patients who respond to these therapies, they tend to be very long standing. And so this was accounted for in the approval process that, that suggested that even though the response rate isn't as high as we would like, the patients that do respond, they respond for a long time. So this is the summary of the current status of well, how we treat patients with so-called targeted and immunotherapies. In the first line setting, we look for HER2 amplification, which is about 15% of patients, and we give chemotherapy with trastuzumab in the first line setting. In the second line setting, all patients, um, so all patients get a chemotherapy with ramucirumab in the second line setting. In the second line setting or higher, if the patients have MSI high tumors, which is relatively rare, pembrolizumab is the treatment of choice. And if uh, the patients have a PDL1 positivity defined as 1% or more of cells um, in the tumor bed being positive in the third line setting or higher, which accounts for about 50 to 60% of all patients, again, pembrolizumab is approved. So there's still more work to do, but we have improved over time. So with that background, what else can we look forward to in the future? How can we boost the immune system and, and get more patients to benefit from immunotherapy? So some, some background that's required to understand this topic and some understanding that we've 
um, uh, gained along the way over the last decades. We now know that cancer is, is um, uh, a combination of things that we inherit, genes that we inherit that may predispose us to cancer, as well as exposures through our lifetime that lead to changes in our DNA that then lead to, over time, um, development of cancerous cells that are not behaving properly. They keep dividing inappropriately and growing. And so the, it is now known that cancer is a, di a disease of our DNA. It is changes in our DNA code which lead to inappropriate growth. Again, this can happen randomly as our cells just happen to have to divide. They can miss uh, copy the DNA code and cause um, abnormalities. And this can be accelerated by exposures throughout our lifetime through viruses, infections, radiation, um, mutagens or carcinogens like chemicals, etc. And that can all lead to changes in the DNA code. And those risk factors are listed here. So when we get these changes over time, the more and more changes that get accumulated, this is sort of something we call the central dogma of biology. Our DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. And protein is the functional component of our cells that are the, the they do things in our cells. So the DNA is the blueprint and the protein are the workers. And so as the DNA is, is coded and made into proteins, if they're abnormal and inappropriately signaling to grow, that's when we get cancer. So with, with that background, those mutations are what we're leveraging with immunotherapy and in, with, um, with vaccines. So tumor antigen selection for cancer immunotherapy, we're going to talk about this and what exactly is an antigen. What is a tumor antigen? So an antigen is a protein that is processed and presented on a surface of a cancer cell that functions as a target for our own immune cells called T cells to go and kill them. So this is our own way of preventing cancer from developing in our body. If you happen to have a cancer cell that has DNA changes, it, it, one of its Achilles heels is that those DNA proteins are broken down made into antigens and expressed on the surface of their cell. This is our way of, of monitoring our cells. And if a T cell comes by and says, hey, that antigen is abnormal, it doesn't look like me anymore, then it will go and kill it. And that's what we want it to do. So these random mistakes or mistakes that occur from exposures to radiation and chemicals, etc. this is our way of going through and proofreading and making sure these cells don't proliferate and continue to grow. Now the cancer cell, as we'll go through um, the next slides, has learned ways to evade this mechanism, but this is what's supposed to happen. And it all is a, centered around this abnormal antigen that came from the DNA change in the cancer cell. So there are different kinds of antigens. There are antigens in our body that are specific to cer certain tel cell types like say CD19 is an example of an antigen that's only present in a certain type of cell in our body, like, like, like blood cells. There are other antigens that are associated with cancer, but are also expressed on our normal cells. So an example relevant to us here in our cancer type is HER2. HER2 is a normal gene, it's a normal protein, and it has normal functions across, nor uh, across our, our normal cells. So it's expressed to various levels in our normal cells. However, in cancer cells, it's really highly expressed. A lot more protein is present of HER2 in a cancer cell. So sometimes our immune system finds it difficult to differentiate, though, between a normal HER2 expressed on a tumor cell and a normal HER2 expressed on, it, on, a, on our normal cell. There are also specific antigens that are overexpressed in a tumor cell and found very rarely in our normal cell uh, tissues. So an example is in our tumor type would be our tumor markers that you may be familiar with like CEA and CA99 and others that are expressed highly sometimes in our cancer cells but are also have been found in limited uh, levels in our normal cells. But the most important one and the one we want to leverage the most with respect to immunotherapy and vaccines are called neoantigens. These are antigens that are only present in the cancer cells and not in our normal cells. And that's because 
they are derived from mutations that are present only in the cancer cells. So you can imagine that it would be easier for our, our T cell to recognize these as being abnormal and really go after it and differentiate from our normal cells, which is what we want to leverage. So that's referring to here, increasing from left to right tumor specificity for our immunotherapies. So with that background here, we've started with chemotherapy from back in the 50s and, and 5FU and others. And over time, we've now learned about genetic sequencing, targeted therapies, and trastuzumab, Herceptin, which is important for HER2 amplification in our cancer. And then most recently, looking at immune modulators like checkpoint blockade, or what we call anti-PD-1 therapy, and some examples are listed here like nivolumab or Opdivo and pembrolizumab Keytruda um, that we've mentioned earlier in, that are now approved in this disease type. So, but we also mentioned how there's a, that this currently only is helping a very small subset of patients. So how can we do better? As I show here in the Keynote 59 study, there is improvement in the therapy with PDL1 positive patients, but it's sort of marginal and or modest at best. And so immuno-oncology offers an opportunity and those patients who do respond to these therapies do very well, but the vast majority don't. And so we need to do more and how can we do that? So some other housekeeping things and background that needs to be understood when we're talking about immunotherapy is how the immune system works. So we've talked a lot about these antigens that come from cancer cells. So if we have cancer antigens, they, they can be released into the uh, nearby environment and travel through the lymph nodes and go into a lymph node. And then they, this represented here in orange, get sucked into these cells called antigen presenting cells. That's, that's what this thing is right here. And so these antigen presenting cells are profession, they're, they're professional cells. All they do is they take these antigens and they put them out on their receptor um, and, and stick them out there, basically. And the reason why they do that is so that they can teach T cells or so-called naive T cells to learn that this is the antigen that is um, present in the cancer cell and to say, this is what we want to go after, guys. And so these T cells that happen to recognize this antigen go here and they then say, okay, we're going to proliferate and make a lot of us that recognize this antigen and then go back out into the bloodstream and go find cancer cells that have this particular antigen on their surface. So one of the things that happens in the level of the lymph node is that there is a checkpoint here called CTLA-4. And that checkpoint is there to balance this so that we don't overdo it, basically. Everything in our body has checks and balances. And so this checkpoint here is just to make sure we don't overdo this and have too many of these cells because sometimes we can rev up the immune system too much and we can cause autoimmunity. So there's a checkpoint here called CTLA-4 and there are actually drugs that block this checkpoint to enhance this learning capability, which you may have heard of. So that, that, that's shown here where there's checkpoint inhibitors that are CTLA-4 antibodies come in, block that check, and then allow this learning system to continue and make more of these T cells to go out and find cancer cells. So now we have more T cells and they're ready to go. So they go through the bloodstream and they go all over the place and then they find a collection of cancer cells, wherever they may be, whether it was where it started in the stomach or whether it's at a metastatic site like the liver. And so you can picture that little orange dot here that's not present right now, but this cancer cell is presenting its, its neoantigen that's unique to its mutations in the cell. And we have our activated T cells that we taught in the lymph node to come and kill it, which we want it to do. The problem is there's another way that cancer cells evade our immune system. And that is they express a protein that we've been referring to called PDL1. And that PDL1 protein binds to PD-1 on the T cells and turns it off, makes it inactive. And this PDL1 can be a reflexive upregulation when T cells come in the vicinity. So they may not be expressing it, but they will if the T cell comes near them type of thing. And so again, we have now checkpoint inhibitors that can come in and block that interaction. 
like pembrolizumab, like we talked about, and allow this cell to now be activated again and go back and kill the cancer cell. So that is how checkpoint inhibitors work. So that's important to understand when we're talking about vaccines, as we'll talk about in a moment. So that's how these particular checkpoints work. So of course now we're trying to do better and there's a number of different ways and what we're gonna focus on for the rest of the talk is personalized vaccines. Trying to find what are the mutations that are present in the cancer that are unique to the cancer, give the vaccine to the patient to make and teach T cells to recognize those abnormal proteins and make a lot of those T cells and then allow them to go and, and attack the cancer. And usually in combination with these checkpoints for the reasons in the last two slides we showed you, that if T cells do finally go into the tumor bed, we have to get past that last check of PDL1. So again, here's a, um, showing how tumor-specific neoantigens are the key in what we're really going at. Whereas if you have normal DNA or so-called wild-type normal sequence of DNA, but you happen to have um, a cancer cell that's expressing these antigens, they may not stimulate an, a, a strong or a robust re immune response. It's really these mutant ones that we're looking at that have changed the DNA, that have changed the protein sequence, that makes it abnormal, and that our T cells can say, yep, that's an abnormal protein, it's not me, I'm gonna go after this. This is what we really wanna go after. And so the key attributes of neoantigens are that they're very tumor specific, they're not in our normal cell, that therefore our, our immune system hasn't had a chance to downregulate these T cells, or that's called central tolerance. And, and the, the important thing to notice, though, is that only a subset of all the mutations in the cancer cell are actually going to be presented on the cell appropriately and stimulate a, um, a, an immune response. So this is a very, very important thing that we're going to show in the next few slides, that um, uh, there can be many mutations in a cancer cell, but only a very, very small subset are the ones that can actually do this and simulate a T-cell response. So the key implications are that it may have a lower risk of therapy-induced autoimmunity because these T-cells are very specific to cancer that we're generating. And uh, we talked about absence of central tolerance. And that this is a very important one as well based on the fact that it looks like a very small subset of mutations are actually what we call immunogenic, we have to be able to predict which ones they are. That's a big challenge and a lot of effort has gone into the ability to predict which ones of the mutations in a cancer, of which there are usually many, which ones are the ones to really go after and put in a vaccine. That's a very critical step. And that's shown here. So in this cancer cell, all these little squigglies are referring to proteins or peptides that are cancer-related and mutated. But you can see that all these orange ones are just sticking around inside the cell. They're not going and getting expressed on the top of the cancer cell. Only a very small subset, the blue ones, or that 1%, are real ant neoantigens that are being expressed and are so-called immunogenic. So it is really important to be able to predict which ones of these they're going to be. And there's been a lot of effort and intense research by various groups in terms of being able to do this, okay? So let's, let's move on from there. So what are some of the other things to consider? When we're talking about um, wh where we're using immunotherapy, another thing that you may have heard of, uh, alluded to, is the tumor mutation burden in a cancer. And some cancers have low mutation burden, and some cancers have extremely high mutation burden, and then there's everything in between. And so what we've learned is that patients that have really high mutation burden, like our MSI high, microsatellite instability, high subset tumors, the little black things here refer to cancer cells that have a lot of neoantigens and a lot of things for the immune system to recognize. So the more mutations there are in a cancer, the more likely there will be mutations that, a can that the RT cells can recognize as being abnormal, that are immunogenic, and that can lead to a response. And so that's why these little green cells that are in here are called existing T cells in the tumor microenvironment. And when I mentioned earlier, when there are T cells around and they're trying to kill cancer cells, 
cancer cells upregulate PDL1 to evade this, that's their defense mechanism. And that's why by using checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab and others, that's why they work so well in these cancers because they already have T cells present, probably because they have a lot of mutations that are, are immunogenic. And all they needed was to release the break of PDL1, and then they, the, the T cells go to town, so to speak. And they, they go after these cancers very, extreme, very rapidly and with very uh, high response rates. On the other extreme, we have tumors that have low mutation burden, and they don't have a lot of neoantigens or black dots there. And so they don't have a lot of T cells because they're not being recognized as being abnormal. And so this is the classic example of where checkpoint inhibitors just don't really work very well. Um, and then there's those that are in between, like for example, this example that has some T cells in there, not as much as here. They have some mutations, not as much as here, but immunotherapy checkpoint blockade can lead to some responses. And that's sort of where we see in our, our third line or higher gastroesophageal cancer patients where a subset of patients like 13% will have a response here by giving immunotherapy. So where can vaccines work best? That's shown here. These types of tumors are the ones that probably have the highest yield in terms of, of vaccination. So if we can identify these neoantigens in these tumors and provide a, a vaccine to stimulate more T cells to filter into these, uh, of these uh, tumor bed, then you see as the vaccine is administered as shown here, that you can get more of these, uh, of these, in this case, new blue cells. The blue cells are the new T cells as well as the older green cells if you happen to have a few there already. And then you can accentuate the response. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you probably need a checkpoint inhibitor because to, to get through that last uh, blockade or defense mechanism of the tumor. So it is very well known in melanoma and other cancers that patients who have more T cells to begin with in their tumor bed, they have a higher chance of deriving benefit from monotherapy checkpoint inhibitors. Those who have no T cells in their in their basic uh, in their baseline biopsies, they have a very low risk, uh, a low rate of response, and they often progress right through these these drugs. So it's important to have T cells that are specific to cancer antigens within the tumor for these checkpoint inhibitors to work. And the idea is that vaccinations can make more T cells, have them go into the T cell bed, and to allow these checkpoint inhibitors to work. So we talked about how we can optimize our vaccines. And really, there's two main arms or two main things that we need to optimize. We alluded to the first one, which is we need to be able to identify what are the best neoantigens in a patient's cancer to put into the vaccine? And so remember, only about 1% of all the mutations are really going to be robust in deriving an immune response. So it is an important to have a good predictive model that is going to be able to say, yeah, of all these mutations, X, Y, and Z are the ones that are the most important to put into our vaccine. Then once you have that, we have to have a robust way to, to deliver these vaccines, uh, excuse me, these antigens in, into the patient so that they can generate a robust response and make a whole bunch of those T cells. And that delivery method is called a vector. And so we wanna be making a lot of these T cells. Uh, and and this, is a, this has also been an area of intense research on how to optimize this. So first, with respect to new antigen identification, we, we, we'll, we'll just take you through what's supposed to happen. So if you have uh, DNA, you have mutations, the DNA is transcribed to RNA, RNA is made into protein. The protein, after a period of time, can be um, uh, 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 degraded into little pieces called peptides, and then these peptides can be um, um, expressed on a receptor up onto the outside of the cell. This sequence is what is supposed to happen. And that is when a T cell can recognize that neoantigen. And it turns out, as we said, only about 1% of all the mutations you start with make it through all of this step. Some mutations that you find in DNA aren't even made into RNA. And some in RNA aren't even made into protein. And some proteins that are peptides aren't expressed on the, on the receptor and put out on the cell. 
So it can be broken down all at many steps along the way, and only a subset will get there. And as I mentioned, there, there are a lot of um, um, groups out there that have spent a lot of time trying to optimize the predictive model of if you have a sequence of molecular profiling, DNA sequencing of cancer cells, how can we predict which ones of those will make it through this whole step? And that's sort of the, the secret sauce to all of this. And, and some may be better than others. And that's a big thing that's being tested in various vaccines to date. So now we've optimized both um, options. What about optimizing the way we, we deliver those antigens that we've decided to put into the, uh, to the vaccine? So in terms of vaccines, a little bit of vaccine 101, the way the vaccines are, are given, if this was uh, the time point at which a vaccine was as, as administered into a patient, we would expect T cells that recognize the antigens in the vaccine to spike over time. This, this is over time. As time goes on, we go to the right. And so the T cells go up, and then over time, they sort of die off, and they sort of taper off a little bit. And there's a few residual ones that linger around, and they are called memory cells. And they're, they're there um, um, to sort of, in case there's a re-challenge of the antigens, they can sort of proliferate and re-recognize it over time. Vectors that can deliver the antigens can include viral vectors, bacteria vectors, and a whole bunch of others. And, and various types of vaccines use various types of these. And which one is best is, is to be worked out, and this is being tested in various studies going forward. So can we do better than just this amount of T cells? Well, we've all, if you remember when you get your measles and mumps and other types of vaccines, you often have to go back for another dose and sometimes many doses going forward. And the reason for that, or it's called a boost, is to give it again, we can sort of stimulate some more T cells and have even more T cells around. So as you can see here, what is called a homologous boost means that we use the same vaccine and vector that we used the first time, homologous. And so you can also see that you got a spike, but it wasn't as good or as high as the first time. And the reason for that is because patients or people will develop sort of immune, uh, an immune response to this and recognize it and neutralize it before it's allowed to work. So we, do, we develop immune, immune response to the actual vector, whether it's a virus or whatever, and that will limit its benefit in the second and later times that you use it. So what has evolved is something called a heterologous prime, uh, boost, which means you use something different to deliver the same antigens the next time than what you used the first time. So you can use something this time and use something different the second time and get an even more accentuated increase or up, uptick in T cells that are specific to whatever the antigens were in the vaccine that you were delivering. And so this, this is another concept that is being developed by some um, uh, groups to, say, to overcome this problem of, of having an immune response to the first vector that was used. So with that background, um, we're, we're trying to generate neoantigen-specific T cells, and how do we do that? How can it be accomplished? So this is a slide that's talking about um, a few things out there that you may have heard of. The first is adoptive cell therapy or, or CAR T cells. So what is that all about? So starting at this point, we have a, a cancer. In this case, it seems to be in the lung. And we get a biopsy or an excision of this, and we have these cells from the cancer. These cells can be put in a little dish and grow. TILS means tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So we can extract all those lymphocytes that may be present inside the cancer cell and try and grow them. Ex vivo, it's called, not in the, in the body. And as these are grown, they can be then infused back into the patient so they've been expanded. So you have more of them and the idea is that we're trying to sort of uh, get more of them and, and send them back to the to the cancer to try and get to try and attack the cancer. Another step that's adoptive cell therapy. We can also do what's called CAR T cells, which is chimeric antigen receptor T cells, where another point after you grow T cells, you, you can actually sort of um, uh, uh, modify them and give them some other qualities 
genetically and then infuse them. That they recognize certain antigens that are on the cancer cell. So this concept, which you is um, at the moment just used in malignant pathology like lymphomas, leukemias, etc. And it's a little bit um, early in the development in solid cancers, solid tumor cancers like gastric cancer. Um, so there are some disadvantages that are listed here um, with this approach. And, and for now, it's not really ready um, for prime time in solid tumors. And there's all intensive research, though, in trying to optimize this for solid cancers. For us, though, and for this talk, we're talking more about vaccines, personalized neoantigen immunotherapy. And so the advantages of this are that it ultimately, once we get the vaccine and we found the right antigens, we made the vaccine, it is ultimately just a simple injection like a, like a typical vaccine, um, in this case shown here in, in the shoulder, deltoid muscle. And uh, generally, the vaccines have been well tolerated. And again, we can maximize the efficacy because we can put many neoantigens into a vaccine, up to 20 in some cases. And, and we've picked the top neoantigens to put in the vaccine and generate a whole bunch of T cells that recognize a whole bunch of different antigens and go after the cancer. And again, this could be done even in the community ultimately, as opposed to this is a very specialized procedure, but there may be advantages and disadvantages to both and um, applications going forward that are specific to various cancers, et cetera. But this is what we're focusing on here today. So the sequencing and the details of actually generating a vaccine would be shown here from left to right. The sequence would be first, we need a biopsy to get the tissue to do the gene sequencing and to find what the mutations are. This can take up to two to three weeks for many patients who've been through all this um, recognize that. And um, we do this often to try and identify targeted therapies like, like we mentioned earlier in the talk. But in this case, we're doing extensive DNA sequencing to identify all the mutations that are present in the cancer. Once we get that, we can then assess whether there are enough mutations in the cancer that would, would predict that the, a, a vaccine might be useful. So you, in those cases where there's very, very few mutations, some, it would be predicted that a vaccine is not going to be that helpful. And so sometimes patients may not be eligible at this time point. This may be a time point that it's thought that a patient would screen fail, for example, from a vaccine study because they didn't have enough mutations. But it would be learned pretty early on in the process. But if you get past that point and we have enough antigens, then the question is, how do we predict those antigens? As I mentioned, there's a big bioinformatics pipeline that it's used to, uh, in various situations and various groups to try and predict which of the mutations that were identified in the sequencing should be put into the vaccine. Once that's done, a long sequence of time takes place in order to generate and put the, va the antigens into the vectors that we talked about earlier, whether it's a viral vector or whatever. And, and then once it's ready, then of course, then it could be injected. And so because it can take a bit of time to do this, um, of course, patients have to be on some sort of therapy to control the cancer in the meantime. And also um, it's, it's been approached in some cases to start this right from the beginning at the, at the right when the patient's newly diagnosed so that they're getting first line chemotherapy during this time. And so when it's ready, then they can add it in as a maintenance approach or if first line therapy has stopped working by this point, they can just be treated as sort of a second line approach um, to try and rescue uh, a control. So that's sort of the sequence of how some of these vaccines are being uh, um, done and tested currently. And so there's a lot of promise and, and, and excitement about it. So the hypothesis of how the, the vaccine should work is um, that once, if we're able to generate a whole army of T cells that now recognize these neoantigens in the shoulder where, um, and lymph nodes nearby that this has been injected, now these T cells can go around the body and try and find where the cancer cells are that recognize these specific neoantigens. And again, probably with the help of a checkpoint inhibitor to get past the last uh, blockade or, or, or defense mechanism of the tumor, then the idea is that hopefully this can help to uh, have more patients derive benefit from immunotherapy. 
Um, again, as I mentioned, probably will need a, a PDL1, PD1 inhibitor to get past the, the last stand that the tumor has to defend itself against T cell. So summarizing then, we, we have a lot of treatments for this cancer, including chemotherapy, targeted therapies, and immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors. We have a lot of clinical studies out there trying to optimize each of these on various fronts and in combination. We've now been able to do genetic testing of the tissue, and, and I didn't mention in this talk, but we can also do genetic testing from the blood now uh, of DNA related to the tumor that's floating around in the blood. And this will help us find targets like HER2 amplification and others to help uh, improve outcomes with targeted therapy. We have immunotherapy with checkpoint block, blockade or checkpoint inhibitors, uh, specifically in our cancer that have been approved are anti-PD-1 therapy, pembrolizumab, in MSI high tumors, which have a response rate of about 60%, and it's approved in second line or higher. Unfortunately, it's not a common thing to have MSI high, but if you do, you don't want to miss that. In patients who are microsatellite stable and PDL1 positive, the response rate is about 13% and indicated in the third line setting or higher. But unfortunately, a large chunk of patients that have microsatellite stable tumors that are PDL1 negative have response rates that are really low and not long standing. And so we need to do more with these patients and we need to do, have, do better with this 13% and make it more patients that derive benefit from immunotherapy. And how can we do that? There's a lot of um, uh, study underway, but one of the really promising things is potentially personalized cancer vaccines that we focused on today. Those are, there are two main things to optimize in a personalized vaccine, and that includes deciding which new antigens to use in the vaccine as a predictive model, and how to deliver those once we identify them to make the best of it and to make the most T cells as possible. And that's called the vector that is used to deliver the antigen. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take some questions uh, and pass the, the slides back to Mary Margaret. Thank you so much, Dan. And as that's switching over for everybody, um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit, um, how far along are the research studies in vaccines for gastric cancer? How common are they throughout the U.S. and what phases are they in? Uh, great question. So the status of the, the, the vaccines are it, typically in early phases. Uh, phase one in the case of the one I'm referring to at the University of Chicago, um, and that is because one of the vectors being used is, is being the first time it's being used in patients. And so um, it, because it's novel, it has to start in a phase one setting. Um, and, and vaccines of various sorts have been in the phase one, phase two setting, essentially. Um, and, and so they're, they're, if they're not usually in a randomized situation where patients are getting a placebo or anything like that. They're very early on in development. And um, there was another um, vaccine study that came to mind that, that was in the second line setting. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the status now. So I think as the, the months and years go by, as the technology has gotten better, we may be seeing a little bit more of this, but it's sort of the tip of the iceberg at the moment um, in gastric cancer. And so um, this is sort of a timely uh, time to do a presentation like this, because I think over the next years, we'll be seeing more of it. Great. Um, and what might a patient want to discuss with their doctor to see if this is a good option for them? What what type of status should they be? How long should they have been in treatment? Or, you know, who would be a good um, participant for a trial like this? Right. So I sort of alluded to earlier how sort of the one study I've been working with, given the fact that these vaccines take a while to make. So I didn't mention earlier, but, you know, the, say, for example, the flu shot. The flu shot is, is uh, made based on what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere in the summertime where it's winter there. And they're looking at what's going on in the flu at that point to start making the vaccine in time so it's ready for us up here in the Northern Hemisphere for when it's our winter because it needs a lot of uh, several months for, for it to be made. So similarly, with these tips of cancer vaccines, you saw the time scale there is like five months or so, um, or six months, like let's be conservative, 
that we, we need to have in order to make the vaccine. And so ideally, we're talking about trying to do this as soon as possible in the care of our patients, because as we've already alluded to with, with prognosis and things like this, that the median survival time is, is 11 months. The median time to progression of, of therapy is about six months in the first line setting and, and shorter in each subsequent line. And so we really want to try and get going as soon as possible. Um, and so that's where many of the studies that I'm aware of are sort of trying to identify patients that are newly diagnosed and to, to start this process early so that we can actually use the vaccine and patients are are in a good condition and doing well enough to actually get it because it may be too late if we start too late, in other words. So that's a great question. And, and so, you know, at this point for patients that have already started therapy um, and are at some other a line of therapy, for example, um, there may be other studies that I'm not quite aware of that could still be, you could still be eligible for. And so the best resources would be, of course, your own oncologist who may know um, to go to tertiary centers um, are, that are nearby you, academic centers, um, and online at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and, and the other thing is to say that what's open today um, is not necessarily what's there tomorrow and vice versa. What's not open today certainly could be there tomorrow. So it's also continually checking is a very important thing to do. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in um, during your presentation was also about kind of the process of the vaccine development. How recent does the biopsy or sequencing need to be in order to produce the vaccine? So I'm, I'm assuming this patient may have had a biopsy months or years ago. Um, does it need to be fresh? It's a great question. And so something that I, I've really focused on in, in, in my research work in this cancer has been uh, molecular genetic heterogeneity, we call it, which means things can change over time. And I think that's what the question is alluding to. And, and certainly if, if there is a vaccine that could be made, um, in a patient, but there's a biopsy that is from a while ago, and there's been, especially if there's been a lot of treatment in between the biopsy and now, um, it is very possible that things have changed. And, Ideally, the recommendation would be to use the most recent sample uh, because that at least has the best chance to reflect what's going on now in the cancer. So it's sort of like common sense stuff. Now, in the setting of where we're, we're talking about we're going to do this in a newly diagnosed patient, and we're, for the most part, that is the most recent biopsy and, and we're, we're going forward. But that's not always the case. If a patient had, say, surgery uh, three years ago, and now it's recurred. And so now we're talking about enrolling in such a study, you know, going back three years ago and trying to use that as a sample, which would be sort of the reflex, may or may not be the best thing to do. But rather, you know, one might argue to try and get a biopsy of the recurrent cancer and use that, even if it is in the newly diagnosed stage four recurrent setting, it, it, that old biopsy sample or, or tumor surgical sample may not be um, the best reflective of what's going on now. Okay, thank you. And I'd imagine the individual trials may have some policy about inclusion of samples based on that time, those time limits. Exactly. Okay. I think we have time for one more question, and uh, it's actually a two-part question. So uh, we're going to sneak an extra one in there. Um, what is the average time to respond to immunotherapy, and what can we expect for response on vaccines? This is a very great question. So classically, it was always felt that immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors would take some time to generate a response because it needed to allow the immune system to learn for a little bit before it was really up and running and ready to go. So you know, I, I guess I would say that may or may not be true. I've, I, in the real setting in the clinic where we've used these drugs, I've had patients literally have responses clinically within a week of getting the dose. And so I, the reason why I know that is because uh, the patients I'm thinking of are patients who had uh, esophageal cancer and they couldn't swallow. 
and they got one dose of a checkpoint inhibitor without chemo and could swallow the week later. And they couldn't swallow for like three months before. So it wasn't just random. So it can be very fast. And so that would be an example of a patient that probably had a bunch of T cells all in the cancer area, but they were just being held back by that last defensive mechanism of PDL1 by the cancer cells. And all it needed was that last push of getting the antibody there, and then they were just ready and poised to go. So, uh, so it could be very quick with just monotherapy checkpoint inhibitor. Um, now, in the studies, the the what's what we call the median time to response, meaning like the time point at which we, when we did see responses, when were they taking place? We were seeing that by two months, the the first time point of getting a scan, essentially. So, you know, it's not as long as m one might expect. Now that said you could get responses late. So you could be just sort of stable for a while and then eventually start having shrinkage eight months later. So we've also seen that too. So there's sort of a wide range. Now, the second part of the question is about vaccines. And so this, this one may take a little longer because we are starting from the beginning now again. We're starting to try and uh, teach uh, T cells to let them proliferate and let them grow. And so it may actually be a little bit of a longer time frame than sort of the, the checkpoint inhibitor with uh, by itself. But I, again, we don't really know yet. So that's something to be determined. But I would imagine it might be a little bit of a longer um, uh, time frame, but we will see. Thank you so much for that. And unfortunately, we are out of time for questions today. But I'd like to thank you, Dr. Catanacci, for sharing with us. This is clearly a really exciting time in research and it's generated a lot of interest and questions from patients and their loved ones. So thank you for presenting and sharing with us today. My pleasure. Okay, so as you know, this webinar was brought to you today by Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. The recorded version of this webinar and our past webinars can be found in our lecture library on our website. I'd like to thank again our gold sponsors, Lilly Oncology and Merck, as well as our bronze sponsors, Genentech and the 1000 Plus Club to Benefit Cancer for providing funding to make these webinars possible. Just a reminder to please check our website for our upcoming events and then check your calendar and be, please join us at an event near you. Thank you to all of our listeners today. This concludes our second in a series of four webinars. Be sure to look out uh, for information about our next upcoming webinar this year. And to view any of our recorded webinars, you can visit our lecture library or our YouTube channel and search by the topic that you may be interested in. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and thoughts, so please send your comments to patient.resource at Thank you for joining us.